Okay. In today's session on Metaversity, an intro to the 3D web, Christina Curley, known to all affectionately as CK, will give us a tour of the much-hyped Metaverse. CK has been a member of the faculty at RBSEE for more than 10 years and has instructed on many technologies across mobile, IoT, AI, and immersive media. And this June, along with our return to in-person sessions, she'll be unveiling her new module in the Rutgers Mini MBA Digital Marketing that covers Web3, Blockchain, and the Metaverse. And on that note, I'll recommend that you all buckle up and hang on for a wild ride as I hand it over to one of the most energetic and positive people um, that I know. And CK, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here today to be talking about new technologies, demystifying them, and shortly to get back to in-person learning. And heck, Maybe this time next year on webinars, just drop in a hint into everyone's ears. Maybe we'll talk about the metaverse from the metaverse. So really what I want to do is I want to cover an intro to this 3D web that we keep hearing about. And that's why I'm having some fun and calling it metaversity, like a little university and an intro. But where I want to start is I want to remind us all that we're in a time of such acceleration where we're looking at so many technologies converging, combining, collaborating, and it truly is in humanity's history to create tools, to improve upon those tools, to shape those tools, and then those tools shape us. And the metaverse is no exception. We are really looking at a multi-decade march to better and better technology. If you think about it, the metaverse is the big what if. What if we went from an interactive web to more of an experiential one? What if we went from 2D websites to 3D metaverses, plural? And really, what if we started shaping our digital world more like our physical world? How would those two overlap? and converge. So today I'm going to be taking us through five key pieces to really start making sense of what the metaverse is and what it will become. So first, we're going to have some fun and we're going to go through meta what. What is the metaverse? What's important about it? Most importantly, what will it become? And then we're going to head over to meta why. And here, I want to go ahead and cover the benefits the drivers and the opportunity. Why is there a there there? What's important about it? Then we'll come around to meta who. Who's building it? And who is it best suited for? Is it only for a B2C business to consumer playground? Or is it also for B2B? And B2G, business to government. And heck, B2E, business to education. So we'll go through meta who. And then we come to meta how. How all can we access the metaverse? And most importantly, how will it change our customers and our culture? You know, I just said that we shape our tools and then they shape us. I believe it was Marshall McLuhan who said that. And just think of a most recent technology with the Anytime Anywhere mobile channel and how it wasn't actually about devices. It was about how it changed our culture our customers, their expectations and their behaviors. So I'd be remiss if we didn't hit on that. And then I'm gonna end, and then we'll have time for questions, but I'm gonna end with meta ready. How to ready today for this 3D web of tomorrow? What are the key questions I should be thinking about? How should I start? How should I learn? So we'll go into that. And then of course, we'll also have time for questions. So on that note, Let's start at the beginning with meta what? What is the vision of the metaverse? What are its attributes? What are the types? What are the uses? What the heck is it? So with meta what, let's start with the metaverse is now and what it will become. Well, first, it's a collection of, think about 3D immersive environments that resemble and function pretty similarly to our physical world, the three-dimensional, interact, interactive like that. And in some cases, actually in many cases, they will either synchronize with the physical world, so it's not always separate, and in other cases, converge with the real world. 
as you'll find by the end of the presentation, where we're going as a humanity, as a species, as different markets is not just being online or being offline, but always residing between the two. You know, I say that we're the last generation that will be like, well, we went online. The next generation would be like, excuse me, we're always online, offline, and in between the two. But that's where the metaverse is now, and it's just starting. Where we're really looking for it to go, it has the potential to revolutionize all aspects of life and business in the next decade across virtual spaces, augmenting physical spaces, and again, a blend of both. The metaverse is this 3D web that can be looked at as the next gen internet and more of an experiential process. Now, what all can we do in the metaverse? Well, if you think about it, think about it like the web, right? Replace that word metaverse with the web. What we can do in the web, it's pretty infinite. Collaborate, work, learn, shop, socialize, earn, explore, and much more. Now, one thing that can be very confusing is the use of the word metaverse versus metaverses. I want you to think of the metaverse as the web and all the different meta lands and metaverses as the different websites. So there's not just one metaverse, there's actually many, and there's a greater one too. Just like we have a lot of websites, some bigger than others, and we have a greater web. Now, is the, what, is the metaverse, I get this question a lot too, the same as what's being called Web3. Actually, the metaverse is part of Web3 because it uses the technologies of Web3. And Web3, in really a sentence, is using decentralized tech. You're hearing the words blockchain a lot to really open the web and to have users' data brought back in their control. But that's a bigger, bigger subject. And not only do I cover that in my module, but I'll actually be having a webinar, I believe in September, definitely in the fall, that covers Web3. But just understand the metaverse is an important part of Web3, but it's one portion thereof because it uses a lot of the technologies. And what's important there is it makes it interoperable between the different metaverses. And then I get the question, which technologies are driving it? It must be virtual reality. Well, that's correct. But actually, it's a lot of technologies. Here, it's a case of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts because we don't just need virtual reality. We need some holography. We need artificial intelligence. We need big data. We need AI. We need wearables. We need blockchain. So it's a lot of different technologies that are powering this exciting, new universe for us. You know, I say, think about it like this, the attributes. Think about it as a new version or a new vision of the web. Think about it as instead of an internet that you're looking at, 2D, it's more like an internet you're inside of. Also, I hit on while it's the next big thing, it's also in many cases the next best thing. It's not to replace face-to-face it's to be something that helps us overcome limitations or it has its own functionalities and benefits. So in that sense, it's the next big thing and it's the next best thing. And here, a really core attribute of the metaverse is this feeling of presence. You know, it's not just interactivity, it's an immersive experience. So that can be really exciting for your programs, your plans and campaigns. And again, 3D websites versus, pardon me, 3D worlds order versus 2D websites. So another big question I get is, okay, what, what type of metaverse or what will the functions be? And there are many, just like, exactly like, there are many platforms on the current web and many different types of websites. For an example, we have Second Life, which has been around for at least 15 years, and that acts like an alternate reality. Actually, the biggest part of the metaverse right now is really digital twins and having that be a synchronized reality. What a digital twin is, it's a digital replica of a physical product, object, place, heck, person, our avatars. That is synchronizing with the real world. Actually, a lot of business to business cases say in manufacturing, I want to be able to check in 
on the factory floor from my office. I'm able to do that through the metaverse. That's a private metaverse. So just like we have intranets and extranets and the World Wide Web, the same two will be true in the metaverse. We can do alternate realities. We can synchronize with reality. We'll have metaverses from big tech players, like with Meta, formerly Facebook, and their Horizon World. So you'll see players, Microsoft too, that'll come from Web 1 and Web 2, wanting to keep their dominance and make a play in Web 3. And then we'll see, we'll see exciting new players like Decentraland, which is run on Web3 and blockchains. And it's really killing it these days. You'll see them a lot in the news. And if you're in the metaverse, make sure and go and try and stake out some land there, but definitely participate because these new players are gonna be really exciting. Just like any time we have a new technology, old world and traditional players can go ahead and modernize. But what's really exciting to see is the entire new world of new players. So we'll have alternate realities, we'll have synchronized realities, we'll have metaverses from the big tech players we know now and those that completely surprise us. Also, I would argue really where the metaverse has started and is the strongest is with the gaming companies, really for two reasons. They understand how to build a universe and they also have avid fan bases and loyal players. They understand immersion and those type of experiences. So gaming companies, whether it's Roblox, whether it's Epic Games, all of those will do really well in helping to create this space. And then we'll have functional space. Maybe we want to hold a hybrid event. Maybe we have a customer advisory board. And instead of doing online 2D Zoom, we want to do 3D immersive meetings within the metaverse and have a space just for that. So it'll be functional spaces as well. So what I want you to take away from this slide and this notion is that the metaverse will be as vast and varied, probably even more as the web is today. Here's a question. What are the applications? What are the use cases? Folks, I cannot fit them all on one slide because one, there are too many, and two, it'll surprise us. It could be for entertainment, for gaming, a better way to train, a better way to learn when you can't be face-to-face. -face. I would argue customer services is a great application for it, as well as digital twinning, research, any kind of data-driven decisions, equipment testing, healthcare, a better way to learn in med school, they're learning from a book, learning in 3D and simulations of surgeries and the like. So really it's not what are all the use cases, what can't be an application or a use case for this? So understand just as fast and varied as life in the web is now, same too, we'll go with the metaverse. So now that we understand a basic understanding of meta what, here I want to take us into meta why. The big questions I always have is what is driving any new technology, any new environment, and why will it succeed? What are the benefits? What problems does it answer? What does it enable us to do that we haven't been enabled to do through all the technologies that we witnessed just in the last five and 10 years? So let's start with the market drivers of why now? with the metaverse. Why is it happening now? I mean, we understand that this was talked about in fun movies and sci-fi books of the 90s and 80s, but why is it becoming more of a reality now? And there's three key factors. First, more tech. The maturation of these technologies. Remember I said technologies, plural. It's not just virtual reality, but artificial intelligence, mobile technology, cloud technology, soon coming with quantum, blockchains, web three, augmented reality, all of these technologies that compound, they reinforce each other. Think of it this way. The metaverse is not maturing in isolation. It takes all of these technologies. And while I know it's a heck of a lot to learn after we've just mainstreamed on so many recent technologies, we're truly the beneficiaries of all these technologies maturing after decades of working on them and compounding and reinforcing to enable 
this brave new vision and version of the web. So first and foremost, the technology is available. Second, more time online. One thing we learned during the pandemic is that it may have paused, and it definitely did, our social activity and so much of our way of life, but it accelerated, all out accelerated the maturation of technology as well as the amount of time that we spend online. We were already online before the pandemic. We need our computers and our processing equipment and all these technologies to run our businesses and our lives. But we became much more comfortable being online and with people through 2D environments, just like we are now with the pandemic. And one thing we're finding is we're spending at least seven hours a day on average online but also as we go back to the workplace, we're not looking to be at a workplace or at home all the time, but a hybrid of both. So many of these activities would actually do us well being in a 3D environment. It's just more immersive. There's higher levels of functionality. So more tech and more time online, and you guessed it, mo money. We're seeing that with all this technology and the proven use case of the web heretofore with all those applications and all the time that we're spending online, these web two and web one players wanna make sure to carve out their relevance, their market share and their dominance in a web three environment. So we're seeing a lot of money being spent by big entities like Meta, like Microsoft, GEs, all the vendors and the like. So we're seeing a lot there. But one thing I really want to hit across is the biggest force that I see happening, and this is happening in consumer environments, business environments, the sciences and all over the world is that we've come to a place where the web is mature enough and we can have the web in our pocket anytime we want with any time, anywhere technology. We're coming to a time where we're not really, um, it's normal for us not to just be online or offline, but always in between. And our technologies are facilitating along with our preferences. For example, we're bringing our digital worlds into the physical world. How? Well, IOT, short for Internet of Things, whether it is your connected Nest thermostat or your connected Tesla or your connected sprinkler system in between, we are bringing our digital world and all that connectivity, all that functionality into the physical world. That's become normalized for You know, I always say with the next generation, any object, thing, or place that isn't connected and smart, they'll just see it as either a relic of the past or broken. So we're bringing our digital world into the physical world we're also bringing functionality through like augmented reality and Pokemon. We're also bringing the digital into the physical. We're overlapping or blurring those boundaries and converging those environments. Heck, when I order an Uber, I'm not just ordering the Uber on my mobile phone and watching for the car in real time. I'm also watching a little car and how close it's getting to my pickup and how far away it is. I am used to being not online, not offline, but always in between the two worlds. And what we're also finding is that we want to make our digital world more like the physical world. You know, I mentioned digital twins earlier. These have been proven and are so successful already. And the demand for them being a critical success factor has just tripled in the last 36 months. Here, we're not just looking at the physical world in our businesses and the digital world, but always having the availability between the two. So we're making our digital world resemble and reflect our physical world. So you see how it's happening on both sides. So the metaverse is in this way, a really natural evolution of this market force of all of us saying, we don't just want online or offline, but being able to be between the two, having the functionality, having those environments and having those options. So what comes to the benefits? You know, when we talk about meta why, we talk about what's driving it and what the factors are in consumers and environments, but we wanna see what's the benefit of a metaverse? And I'm gonna distill it 
put the pointer today into three areas. First, overcoming limitations. So what the metaverse can do for us is to help us and stretch us beyond barriers, limitations, obstacles, heck, frustrations of the physical world, where it's a time when we're looking at any limitations, whether we're not able to participate in the physical world, if we're housebound, if we can't all come together for a face-to-face -face event. Heck, here's a limitation. Only 20% of the world speaks English, yet 80% of the web, the World Wide Web, is in English. Yet with a little AI added into the mix and having real-time translation, that's a huge barrier and a huge obstacle that can be overcome. Look at the developing markets. We really want to open up the web. We really want to open up this universe to more and more markets. So we're overcoming a lot of limitations, barriers, and obstacles. So that's one benefit and one argument. And two, and here's a big one for marketing and advertising, we want to transform our customer interactions. Like even just with customer service, we want to transform the interactions between companies and customers. Why? More personalization, better functionality, more streamlined. Things like this is a real big area of benefit for all companies, whether it's B2B, B2C, and so on. And third, like I just talked about with convergence and overlapping, overlapping, converging, think of it as building a bridge between the physical world and the virtual world or the digital world. I'll get into NFTs um, in a little bit, but that can be a real way to bridge as well. So three key areas, and I'm gonna come back to this at the end when I talk about some samples here of overcoming limitations, transforming interactions, and third, converging worlds, which will become all but commonplace to us within a short 12, 24, 36, and 60 months. Now, big question I get is how long until the metaverse gets here? Well, it's here. It's just a bit and some disjointed bits and pieces, but it is here and it's going to be evolving and evolving quickly because of these factors I talked about before, more maturation of tech, more time online, and more money being spent on it and invested into it. It is going to mature quickly all through the 2020s. So now let's look at MetaWho. And we want to answer two key questions here. One is, who is creating this metaverse? And then who is it right for? just for consumers? Is it just for business? Is it just for educators? It's actually D, all the above. So in MetaWho, who is building the verse? We're really looking at four key groups here. First, big tech. We're seeing a lot of news on big tech, whether it's Meta and Facebook, whether it's Microsoft, but we're seeing a lot of news come down the pike on web one and web two players that are seeking to retain their dominance and really edge out really interactive, really immersive space for their users and their customers. So big tech, huge part of building out the metaverse. Like I said before, these video game companies, video games, have understood how to engage their users and acquire new users and high loyalty for well over a decade. But these video game companies are ones to watch and ones to really, really learn from. I love what Roblox is doing and being able to develop our own video games and all the communities it's creating there. While it's happening online, if you ask any parent, if you ask any gamer, they'll say, it doesn't matter if it's online or offline, this is a real experience to me and it is as strong to me as offline environments have been. So big tech and video game companies. And then this whole quadrant of Web3, all these cool Web3 startups and organizations and advocates and enthusiasts, you heard me say Decentraland earlier, that's a Web3 company. Roblox, that's a Web3 organization. So Web3 is going to be making a big play here in creating the universe and the metaverse. And fourth, brands. Brands that are investing in all types of examples and initiatives, B2B and B2C, 
within the metaverse. And you're going to see a lot of pilots. You're going to see a lot of novel examples. Some will succeed. Many will fail. And that's all part of what I'll say, you know, failing fast and scaling forward and learning from those mistakes. Pilots are going to get us everywhere and samples and ideas because this is what's going to be building out this space and what's so exciting about seeing it develop right in front of us. So let me get some examples here. So big question, who's the metaverse for? Is it mainly for consumer CK? Is there B2B opportunities? How about B2G? Let me give you some examples because just like the web, exactly like the web, it's for every group, every market, every type of customer and consumer. So B2C, business to consumer. Retail comes to mind with shopping, but the way in which we do retail I love what Vans have done, the sneaker company, right? They've created an entire Vans world, a veritable skating uh, park, you know, where you can really have a community with like-minded professionals, learn a lot. And yes, you can wear your virtual Vans shoes and you can buy those and don the clothing, but it just is, an, is a really neat example of consumer and shopping through vans that's being used in a different way in the metaverse. McDonald's, they've, they've filed for a lot of patents. So we're saying, well, what a fast food retailer, I mean, can they get a virtual Happy Meal? What are they really going to do in the metaverse? Well, you may be just like you're able to now order through them on your mobile phone. You may be able to order from the restaurants, but it may also look to increase and compound their branding in very different ways. Maybe they will partner with musical acts like uh, Fortnite has done with concerts with Ariana Grande and Travis Scott, which actually got, I think, like 60 times the amount um, of customers and fans go that then could go to like a Woodstock back in the 60s because it's easier to go online but maybe McDonald's is gonna go ahead and partner with key talent and get their brand out there. Maybe it's gonna be a new way of customer service. Maybe they'll use also intranets for better training. A big part of what companies are finding right now is training needs to be more immersive to learn, hands-on, right? And also much more engaging for their users and their audiences, which brings me to business to business and like workforce training. I believe it's Accenture that has invested in something like over 40,000 VR goggles because what they want to do is they want to transform their ongoing reskilling and lifelong learning for their employees, but they want to bring an added bit of an immersive content and a better experience and better community to it. The so business to business is using it in ways for retraining and reskilling. Also, like I was talking about before, business to business is using it in ways like creating a digital factory, a digital twin of the factory floor like Anheuser-Busch has done. Think about for B2B, you know, for my B2Bs, our, our thought leadership is so key. How could we transform that in an immersive environment? How could we make that more compelling, more interactive and give our users, our customers and our prospects so much more value through that? So B2B, B2C is already mining opportunities in the metaverse. What I think is fascinating is how fast some governments have started building out the metaverse. Seoul has already said by 2023, they're going to have a presence in all of their governmental departments in the metaverse to make it easier for their citizens to interact, to ask questions, to explore. And they also, what I think is really fascinating, is they categorize their metaverse and all of their um, programs there under their smart city initiatives. They're saying, if we're really gonna make this a smart city, it's not just about connecting and digitizing the real world elements, but it's also about bringing those real world elements, you guessed it, online. So again, those bridges and that convergence. I love what Barbados has done. It has the first metaverse, uh, pardon me, the first embassy in the metaverse on Decentraland. And they were the first to go on there. And they said, you know what? We may be a small country 
population wise and land wise, but we can make a big splash in the metaverse. We can punch above our weight. You know, one success story that I talk about a lot is Estonia, an Eastern Bloc country that 20 years ago made the decision to really go high tech. And while its population was under a million, they said, you know what? We can change things from where we are. We can really use digital technologies. All of their citizens' healthcare records are on a blockchain. They have wonderful programs in digital communities and the like, and they use robotics like you can't believe because they're always punching above their weight. And they are called the little country that could because they set the standard for what can be done with digital technology. Heck, in mobile commerce and mobile pay, it was Kenya that broke the code first and foremost and had mobile pays that had mobile currency well before and still before a lot of the, the bigger and developed, more developed countries did. So look for these really neat examples that feel like, you know, they come out of nowhere to really make a big splash in the metaverse, because it doesn't matter how small you may be in the, in the physical world, it's how big the impact is. It's what limitations you overcome. It's how you can transform interactions between your customers and your citizens and how much you can bridge overlap and converge physical and digital worlds. So the answer is, who is the metaverse for? It's for all of the above. You're gonna see a lot of online training really get amped up in online learning as well, along with of course marketing, operations, customer service, you name it. So now that we've gone through meta who, let's go through meta how. First, how to get there, how to get around, and what's most important for my marketers out there, how will it change customers and culture? So let's start with how to get to the metaverse. Well, obviously the biggest functionality is by using virtual reality and virtual reality goggles. And you're gonna see a lot more come onto the market just like, exactly like we saw a heck of a lot of different mobile phones and smartphones over the last 15 years. But virtual reality is right now gonna give you the most immersive experience and the most functionality. But it's not the only on-ramp because heck, even though I may have an Oculus Quest 2 headset, I may not always be able to do that to get into say a conference or a webinar. I may need to go from my 2D computer screen. You absolutely can do that. You can go to Decentraland right now. You can go to different meta lands on the 2D computer. You just won't have the ease and functionality of say virtual reality, but heck gaming consoles. Also upcoming right now we have HoloLens through Microsoft, but upcoming holography headsets that really give you a nice bridge between the 2D and 3D world and for your basic smartphone. So there'll be a lot of different on-ramps to the metaverse, but the levels of functionality will differ of course. But it's important to understand the different technologies that we can enter the metaverse through. So how to participate once there? Well, your digital twin of your actual person, your avatar. I say like having a presence on websites right now and social network platforms, that's what your avatar will become. So once you go into the metaverse, you're gonna be able to decide, do you want your avatar to look just like you or do you want it to be completely different or do you want a few? That is up to you but how you're gonna participate and how you're gonna get around is through your avatar. And how to navigate, navigate around, we call it teleporting. Think about it as easy as clicking on a link today. And this is why it's really important. You're gonna see a lot of news on this, on how the metaverse needs to be open and how there needs to be interoperability. Because if I'm going from one metaverse, say Facebook horizon to Decentraland, I'm going to want to take my avatar with me. I'm going to want to take all those fun shoes and clothes that I bought, all that functionality with me easily and seamlessly. So we're going to be seeing a lot on that. But understand, when we get to the metaverse, a lot of on-ramps there, the functionality will differ. 
our avatar will be our presence or avatars, right? And how we'll navigate around instead of clicking on links, we'll teleport around. Two key areas of stuff and buying stuff in the metaverse. Well, we'll have metaverse money, we'll have digital currencies and we'll have cryptocurrencies. And actually a lot of different metaverses or these meta lands that I talked about, like the center land versus sandbox versus say Roblox, have their own types of money that you can use within those sites in those areas. I'm giving two examples here. One that's called Mana, that's Decentraland's currency, and another it's called Sand, that's Sandbox, that Sandbox's currency. Those are two different platforms within the metaverse. Just to understand, we'll use those digital currencies to buy stuff. And what's really interesting is in many of the uh, metaverses and many of the gaming ones, you can actually play to earn this money. There's an added incentive for groups and for users. So metaverse money, that's going to be crypto. It may be crypto like Bitcoin, or it may be more of a digital currency like Mana. Okay. And metaverse goods. This is why you're hearing the fabulous term. Actually, it was Webster's Dictionary's uh, word of the year, NFT, non-fungible non tokens. What we have to answer here is when it comes to online, when it comes to the maturation of online in the metaverse, how do we buy stuff and how do we make sure of ownership and it is actually being owned by just us and not others? It's non-fungible. That's what NFT solves. And what you'll find here is there's going to be a lot of create creativity, some fun, some functional on what NFTs will span. But where I think it's really interesting is where brands and companies can bridge physical and virtual world. Maybe if I'm buying those Nikes in the real world, I also get a pair of those Nikes for my avatar in the virtual world and actually vice versa. Again, how can you converge? How can you have incentives? Maybe if I go to a real world event or a real world con a concert, I'm able to get an NFT where I can be a participant in a virtual concert six months later. You're gonna see a lot of creativity here. But one thing that's really important to understand for our customers and for a lot of the new populations coming into the web, they won't necessarily discern between virtual goods and physical goods because both will have value. We need to understand how quickly the space is moving. Heck, on another point entirely, Fidelity Investments just came out, just came out in the last 72 hours and said up to 20%, 20% of your 401k can be in Bitcoin. Now, that is a traditional company, a centralized organization saying, we are giving a hat tip to decentralized money, to decentralized finance and the like. So between virtual and physical goods, they both have tremendous value. Now, this is what I want us to keep in mind, especially as marketers, as communicators, as creators, is that, like I said at the very beginning, first we shape our tools and then they shape us. This has been um, a repetitive thing in humanity for decades and decades for just really our evolution. If you think about it, just with the mobile phone, what I call the real mobile revolution, it's not phones, it's not functionality, that's important. The true mobile revolution is how it changed drastically and permanently, our communities and our culture's behaviors, expectations, preferences, just the way that we go about life. Look at how different we are because of the mobile technology, the anytime, anywhere, always on channel. So we need to look at how are our customers gonna change? How are our prospects gonna change? And how do we need to change when we're going from a transition on mobile to a 3D web. I love uh, this quote here from Annie Zhang at Hello Metaverse Podcast. I think this transition is like the one from desktop to mobile. Mobile internet may not have been groundbreaking, but the way in which we interacted with the world 
fundamentally changed. Here at Time, uh, Andrew Chow says, as users continue to adopt these technologies, their ability to transform since society in unpredictable ways will only accelerate. One thing we're finding is that due to being in an age of acceleration and all these technologies maturing at once and reinforcing one another, not only are the amount of groundbreaking inventions increasing, what's really happening is the adoption timelines are going in half. It took 40 years for TV to go mainstream, it took 10 years for the internet took five years for mobile. So we're, we're changing more quickly than we think. We talk about changing, we actually adapt quite well. So the big thing here is don't just have an eye on the technology, really keep your gaze on customers, users, participants, creators, how they're changing. Because that will be the true metaverse revolution just like all technologies before it, and just like all technologies that I'll continue to create introductions and explainers on until, well, for the rest of my life, because I'm just a big old. So let's end before we take some questions on Meta Ready. You know, all this is great, ZK. I've learned what the metaverse is, what we can expect, how to get there, what the driving forces are, what are the, benef what are the benefits, but what can I do now? And by now, I mean, what can you do this business quarter and what can you do this year to start prepping today for the 3D web of a fast approaching tomorrow? So I'm gonna go through this slide again. I'm gonna give you some questions to ask yourself. Remember what I talked about with the benefits and these are all equal and these may apply to your business. Two of them, one, we'll see. But first, overcoming limitations, just like the web, just like mobile, this technology overcomes limitations and how it does that is it stretches us beyond these limitations, barriers, obstacles of the physical world. So that's first and foremost. I always say, if you wanna get an avid marker, market, solve a problem, make things better, faster and easier. Two, how can we transform our interactions? How can we be more personalized? give our markets more functionality? How can we improve upon our existing programs and then look at creating all new programs? And third, this driving force and this major change of converging world, how our worlds are overlapping, converging and, and building, building bridges between not just always being online or offline, but forever between the two. Let me give you some questions to ask yourself. Because what, what I want you to do is I want you to ponder these. And then what I do is I always make some time, whether it's reading books, whether it's listening to eBooks on a commute, whether it's finding some top three podcasts, heck, add the hashtag to metaverse when you go into Twitter or the social network of your choice, and you'll find a lot of great eBooks on it, a lot of great articles, a lot of great discussions. But of portion that time to learn because this is coming. So on overcoming limitations, ask yourself, through the metaverse, could I reach an entirely new market? How about, this is a big one, streamline or remove friction from an existing customer process or task. I'll tell you, it was revolutionary when we could download a mobile app to be able to do what? Deposit our physical checks instead of stopping everything, getting in our car, driving to a bank, finding a parking spot to get in line, to then go to the ATM or teller, reverse the process, go home. And then we got to wait 24 to 72 darn hours to get our own money, right? But what happened was apps made things better, faster, and easier. So how could you streamline? What could you streamline through a process to make things easier, faster, better solving a problem for your audience? Or how could you improve upon existing programs in an immersive world? Could your events, their hybrid events, be in the metaverse as well as in the real world? How about thought leadership for B2Bs? You know, thought leadership is a lot of our bread and butter. Videos are great, text is great, but how immersive could we be online? How could we transform customer interactions? Think about 
which applications I talked about earlier, as many ways as there is to use the web, there are that many and more for the metaverse. What could we use it for and how could we use it? Think about what content could you leverage? What content is best in an immersive experience? It's not gonna be copy and paste. It's gonna be its own environment. So you're gonna see a lot of experiments here. Think about how you could transform the way in which you interact with your audience, whether you're business to business or business to consumer. Think about how much more we can personalize our messages, our campaigns, heck, how we could really experiment with NFTs to do what? Personalize as well as converge physical and virtual worlds. Maybe those virtual clothes, you're also getting those physical clothes. You can do a lot between the two because the metaverse is completely open there. So how could your metaverse programs overlap? How about using the metaverse to make online and offline programs far more cohesive? This is one I, I think about a lot when I, when I teach on IoT, Internet of Things. What point in the physical world, heck, think about when we were you know, catching virtual Pokemon, what points in the physical world provide you convergence opportunities? Is it a place? Is it a product? Is it an object? What is that that you could bridge that would make it more seamless and help to overlap those worlds? So these are three key areas to think about. Also, if you can afford it right now to get a virtual reality headset, those prices are definitely gonna be coming down or maybe your department at work can. So you can start spelunking and exploring, but also a lot of great content, ideas, um, discussions are available on social networks. Just do hashtag metaverse and, and use these social networks for business purposes. Well, I'm hoping that we were able to get this a little demystified and to make sense of this brave new world across the meta what's, meta why's, meta how's, meta who's, and getting ready. And I really am hoping we can get some questions answered. We have a little bit of time. And so I'm going to ask my trusty companion and my moderator, Margaret, to please come and see what kind of questions we might have because we have some time. And I want to see, Meta, what's from the audience? What do you have questions on? What are you thinking? Well, I think everyone loved the presentation thus far, CK, but oh, um, we I'm definitely pleased. do have a couple. Cool. Um, so uh, the first is someone I think who's having trouble uh, visualizing what it looks like, and they'd like to know if you have a clip of what a place in the metaverse looks like. You know what? I don't have a clip in this presentation, but I can follow it up with some clips because um, actually, if you go to YouTube, they'll give you um, some simulations too. And I'm sorry I didn't include that. I, I actually didn't think about that, but I should have. But if you go to YouTube and click um, simulations in the metaverse or what does it look like, it will give you a really good idea. Some sites are very basic and some are really getting much more advanced just every single day. So, so go into YouTube and I'll also send some clips as a follow up to Margaret. Well, and, uh, CK, we can actually provide any um, items that you have for follow up in our follow up because everyone gets a copy of the recorded version of this and we'll add Perfect. it. Perfect. So email. I'll include I'll include several links on that. And I thank you for that. So we should have follow up to you. I think our follow up comes in the next 48 to 72 hours. Am I correct? We take a little bit of time to um, put some branding on and get the uh, email uh, ready. So, um, but as soon as it does come out, we um, send it to our participants right away. So, okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, and next question is yeah. that um, within an organization, what mm -hmm. teams or functions do you see as owning the metaverse space? Oh, this is a great question. So what teams or functions are going to own? I believe that different departments are going to, because it's, you know, to be determined, are going to own different functions within that, just like exactly like we do in the real world. I know it's hard to get our minds around, but it's a virtual world. But if you think about it, we're going to need uh, marketing. We are going to need 
product development. We are going to need sales. We're definitely going to need customer service, heck, HR, and better training for a remote workforce. So I think what's going to be really interesting and can be a huge opportunity for companies is they're going to be owning different parts of that. There's also going to be, just like a lot of companies have intranets, they're going to be digital twinning to see efficiencies and the like. So that won't be a part of the public metaverse. But I actually think it's going to need to be basically across much of the organization, um, but definitely sales, marketing, HR, um, any kind of product development. So it's going to be different within. So it might be a year from now, you're appointing a different point person at having quarterly meetings around this because it's going to be just like needing to do that in the physical world. Great. Great. Good question. Thank you. So um, we have another question about yes, um, for more conservative brands that need to mm -hmm. see an ROI before investing into the metaverse, how would you promote the value of investing? Well, uh, a few ways. Uh, one, the metaverse, this is what's beautiful, uh, as far as B2B land and for B2C companies, but internal, has already been, been proven 20 times over by digital twins and digital replicas. Um, companies, um, say a Verizon, for, for example, will have a digital twin um, of all their cell towers to be able to predict and prevent downtime. So we've already had a lot of the successes um, internally on that B2B side. But one thing that I would suggest is that right now is a time when you can start and it's not as high a price tag. So you can start doing some pilots like looking into areas like uh, Decentraland or Facebook Horizon. So you can start small and do those pilots and learn really fast. But also for conservative companies, one thing that I highly suggest is just doing quite a bit of research to see where all these traditional companies are already investing. Actually, Margaret sent me a great example yesterday from Unilever, um, a consumer packaged goods company with their degree deodorant, and they held the first meta-thon instead of marathon in the metaverse. So they're actually saying, we need to start looking at that. So I would I do research and show that you can start on a, a smaller budget and that you wanna start now instead of having to compete higher and higher later. So I think that's really big. And also bringing to them that there's already been quite a bit of success when it comes to digital twins, which is like an intranet for, for the company. So it's not always starting from scratch. That's great. Um... And the next question came with a lot of background. So I'm going cool. to ask the question first and then try to fill in a little bit of um, how he uh, prefaced it. So the question is, Perfect. how do we avoid a future where there's a single company like IOI from Ready Player One that controls mm -hmm. the metaverse? And he had said um, a lot about, you know, centralization, yeah. decentralization, you know, um, hardware mm -hmm. and platforms yeah. and interoperability and so forth. Oh, I love this question. Um, well, first and foremost, what I love, uh, I'm going to talk a, a, a little uh, bigger on, on Web3. What I love about Web3, which really suffers from definition, I understand. Um, but Web3, big, big premise is to actually take power back from a few companies. And I know I'm saying this a day after a billionaire just bought a big social network. And right now, let's be honest, the internet is basically owned by four or five white guys. So we actually wanna do something that becomes more democratic. This is the beauty of Web3 because what we're looking to do is we're looking to build these metaverses and these spaces, and I'm gonna say the majority of them, easily 90% of them, though there will be some big players, but we're looking to build them on blockchains, or I should say distributed ledger technologies, but I don't wanna to get to the weeds. So blockchain, which basically means the data is centralized. It is owned by no one and owned by everyone, but our data, our decisions, our choices come back to the users and creators. 
even the biggest gaming companies right now are saying this web has to be open. So they're already seeing the importance of this. So the way that we do not become like Ready Player One, so great movie and Ready Player Two is coming out next year. Um, the way we don't become dystopian is that we're building using new technologies that are actually remediating from problems of web two, fewer platforms having outsized power and hearkening back to the promise of the web in web one. Tim Berners-Lee, what did he say? This is for the world. What we need to do is we need to improve going forward with what I love so much about web three. We are already seeing a ton of investment and a ton of scrappy startups, as well as big gaming companies using these technologies so that users have more control over their power, their time, and their decisions. So um, it's, it's a big answer to it, but I love this question. And that's what I'm really loving about the metaverse now, because we're using technologies that will help us be more secure. There's still risks, there's still challenges, absolutely. But we're also looking to take that power back. We're finding success in those factors. Decentraland is a Web3 uh, company. I do not know yet if Meta will be a closed or open network, they'll need to be interoperable, but you're gonna see a big heat up be be between why it's so important to give users back their data and their power and how they'll actually be more loyal to you. So that's gonna be exciting rough and tumble and I am 100% here for it and the technologies are here for it. Well, Great fantastic. Question. Great question. That's all I could go through then to keep it to mm -hmm. time, but contact me after because I love that part. Yeah. Right, I'm going to unbundle and rebundle a, a question here because I think we Ooh. might want to make a, clar a clarification about the metaverse is not the company meta. So would you just address uh, that for one okay. second? I'm going to address that meta and, and, and I'm saying this honestly, I'm not saying this with bias at all. Meta would love for you to think that the metaverse is meta. That very smart rebranding in the in the in the name also i think they want you to look over here at what's new and not all the problems from before so uh the metaverse use the metaverse in your mind as a replacement for the web no one owns the web everyone owns the web absolutely positively without question there are few players that own a lot of big platforms but what decentralization does is make say the ubers of the world owned by the collective Uber drivers. So what we're looking at is we'll have a lot of big players, but you're gonna have a lot more power shifting when it comes to the metaverse and web three. Meta is a big player. And I actually love the fact that they're putting so much money into this space because it can help evolve it. But Microsoft has actually had a metaverse, a B2B metaverse known as Mesh, for longer than Meta has. They've just been quieter about it. So thank you for um, asking that because I always want to clarify. They are one big player, but they don't own it. Nope. No and one owns it. Everyone well, owns it. Let's close with the um, opportunities um, for the metaverse from this perspective. What are okay. employment and job opportunities and how do people prepare for them? Okay. So some of them, uh, we, we don't know yet, because if I had asked my grandmom in the year 2000, what's a data specialist, she would have thought I was absolutely crazy. So some things we don't know yet, right? But what we do know is the technologies that will be important, okay? So getting more familiar and comfortable with virtual reality, with augmented reality, understanding even from you know a top line data analytics and what's important there better understanding hey when we talk about ai what's the, all the functionality to it so being and, and i'm telling you there's a lot of courses here at rutgers and there are a lot of youtubes online that will give you a top level view and top level understanding of these technologies that's important but i also want you to think when it comes to jobs, not the ones we can't think of just yet, but we'll know soon, 12, 24, 36 months, but understanding what will we need 
right now for the functions that are going to be in the in in the metaverse. We know that marketing is going to transfer there. I think there's going to be a lot more customer service. I mean, heck, even governments are getting in on this quicker than a lot of B2C companies. I think we all don't want to go to the DMV, but if we're going to want to go, we want to go quickly and online to renew and the like. So those types of functions, we can already see there would be an opportunity for it because it would be less expensive for companies and there will be avid usage by consumers and citizens. So I think sales, I think anyone that can communicate well, training will be huge. A lot of training, a lot of schools need to be able to convey information, but it's not like just from a book or on a flat screen. We need to be able to simulate that. In healthcare, we're finding a lot of success, not just in mimicking surgeries and the like, but for parents of autistic kids that want to better understand and empathize with those conditions, apps in virtual reality, where they have a better understanding of what is the world like for them? So how can I be a better caregiver? So just about the answer is some are going to find out technologies we know of, we want to get a better understanding of. But just about any of the functionalities in the real world, we're going to need help in the metaverse. And we see this already on the present day web. We're learning, you know, online right now. So these are great questions, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. fantastic. Um, fantastic job by you. Thank you so much for the, you know, passionate and informative discussion. Okay. Um, and also to our audience for, uh, for like you said, for their fantastic uh, questions. Um, so I just wanna uh, close out by telling everyone that RBS webinars are on the move. Um, watch for our future webinars to take place on Fridays at noon Eastern time. So for more information, you can always visit our webpage. It'll be emailed to all registrants, so um, they don't need to write this down if um, they happen to be listening on the live audience. Um, business.rutgers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong dash learning. And okay. we have an exciting schedule of topics and presenters lined up um, over the next several months, thanks to great suggestions from our audience. So we encourage everyone to keep sharing great ideas with us. We want our series to continue to meet your needs. So stay online briefly for um, a moment longer as today's webinar ends, because you'll immediately see a very brief three question survey about today's event and one of them is a free form field to type in topics and or speakers they'd like to have featured in our webinars and then finally as i mentioned when our webinar began earlier a link to the archived recording of this presentation will be shared via social media and emailed to everyone it'll be um, also be found on the business insights page of our website so ck thank you thank you thank you always an enjoyable time spent with you always informative oh, um, and to our good. wonderful audience thank you as well bye for now and have a great day thank you